Welcome, welcome back to the W3C meetings. Uh, you'll all have seen the agenda uh, circulated yesterday, I hope. So yes, the main topic of the call, as Nick has just alluded, is uh, probably going to be the safeguarding aspect of the um, uh, opportunity specification. Um, but I think possibly, because we've actually quite a large call today, uh, possibly a round of introductions would be in order. So I'll, I'll start. Uh, I'm Timothy Hill, uh, Data Standards and Technical Lead for Open Active as a whole. And if we can just go around in a circle, that would be great. I think we're all in a different order, if that helps. We're all in a different order. OK, right. Uh, Nick, how about you next, then? <laughs> uh, sure, uh, Open Active uh, Technical Engagement Lead uh, working at the ODI. I uh, also have a hat that is uh, I'm in related, but we'll be representing the ODI on this call. Hi, I'm Siv. I am a developer at IMIN. Thank you, Siv. Hi, I'm David from Trainers One, AI powered running coach. Thank you, David. Hi, I'm um, uh, co-founder of Played. Hi. Oh, yeah, sorry, that was, that was Tom from Played. Thank you. I, <coughs> hi, I'm Tom from I'm in. Um, I think Tom's on a train and I'm also on a train, so uh, I think apologies if it cuts out at any point. Right, okay. Thanks, Thanks Tom. Hi, Chris Norfield here from London Sport. Uh, we look after open sessions. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the main topic, as I said today, is the booking specification proposal, uh, which um, Nick and I, mostly Nick, crafted on a train ride, um, and then Nick very graciously wrote up into an extended proposal um, for everyone to review. Uh, so I've, I've just, re just now added the link into the presentation. Um, oops, there we go. So if you've got the presentation in front of you, um, then you can just click on that link. I'll also uh, stick that into the chat channel. One moment. Okay, so uh, you should have the link in the chat if you don't have the presentation in front of you there. Um, now, I think one of the first conversations we probably need to have is going to be about scoping, in fact. Um, we've had a few conversations around this, and there seem to be a few different relevant senses of the word safeguarding that we might have to think about a little bit. Uh, let me just start uh, screen sharing again here. Um, sorry, I've got far, far too many tabs on here for easy screen sharing. There we go. Okay, so here's safeguarding and trust networks. Um, so Nick, feel free to jump in at any point as I just kind of walk through the the safeguarding spec as it exists so far. Um, um, Tim, Tim, before you do that, is it worth seeing if Tom wants to give a bit of an intro from from his perspective of why this has come about? Yeah, sure. Actually, that that. Yes, was cool. Oh, sorry, I missed that. What was that? Sorry, I was just about to jump in and then the lady on the um, prompt, teleprompter on the train interrupted. Um, so yeah, apologies if I cut out, but um, the reason why I kind of brought this to the group was uh, numerous conversations that I've had um, with active partnerships, local authorities who all want to encourage uh, their smaller providers to open their data and through tools such as open sessions and then comes the realization that um, some of the bigger activity finders uh, change for life for example was not accepting sessions from um, individual operators they had to be pre-approved um, that in the time from when i raised it to now has, has kind of been dealt with um, by change for life displaying a kind of warning message that they're not responsible for the for the operations of the sessions, but I feel like there's still a better version of, of that and something that can, can be sustainable into the future. 
Perth. I've talked to Chris, who's on the phone uh, on this call today as well from uh, London Sport, who's responsible for open sessions. And it'd be good to start the conversation and see if anyone has any, any ideas of yeah, creating something that's like a cross network or mm -hmm. another version of that. Okay. Um... I guess at this point, uh, well, I guess I guess the first question is actually, does anybody else on the call, have you already done work in this direction? What are the current safeguarding mechanisms for your organizations? Or is I might just add, I had a conversation with um, Izzy from uh, Sport England this morning, and she wanted to make this call because there is some work happening at Sport England around safeguarding. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be worth picking it up with them. Unfortunately, they can't be represented on the call today, but um, touching base with what they have already in place and if there's any way to incorporate it. Okay, right, thank you. So uh, action, I guess, on me to contact Izzy about this. Yeah. And get state of the art there. Um, Just regarding um, open sessions, Chris here from London Sport. Just to confirm that we literally we don't do any um, kind of safeguarding at the moment. Anyone can upload any activity um, to open session, so there's nothing in place. But we are certainly kind of keen to explore options for that. And um, kind of particularly, we've seen a few different use cases. So looking at more stuff around social prescribing, getting lots of feedback from social prescribers that they'd want to be have some element of confidence, trust, um, knowledge about the um, qualifications or the suitability of a activity provider to for them to actually use open data so there's definitely a couple of use cases that we're interested in okay so there's definitely a demand there um and I've, i probably should also represent um lee uh from mcr active and Anne marie who couldn't make the call today at the center apologies but um will potentially be able to make another uh, another call in the future if needed um and that is uh the mcr active as a um for those who aren't aware it's a it's a it's a I think they sent something around the list actually, so you may have seen that about something else, but um, they, they're building an activity finder Manchester wide that's going to allow for local leisure operators and also lots of smaller providers to, to be um, bookable in one place for Manchester. Um, and uh, that's going to be called MCR Active. Uh, the challenge they have with that is obviously to um, put their, their brand to it. They wanted to make sure that every provider, small and large, that was on there was uh, did have a level of something like uh, safeguarding certificate or whatever it is that's necessary to, to give them confidence that they, these providers are um, well-intentioned and well-equipped to deal with vulnerable adults and children specifically. Um, so uh, the, the work with that was to actually, um, they've, they've got three trust levels, they call them, um, which they associate with um, different providers and, um, and also some actually uh, specific activities for certain providers so it might be that a Zumba instructor gets gets just um, a, a trust level two for Zumba uh, but not if they started to run Pilates they might need to um, go through that process again um, and they actually have a dedicated person in NCR um, that uh, that reviews organizations uh, to check that the, the various documents that they're providing are relevant um, and then um, assigns the trust level on that basis um, and we understand that Sport England have something similar with Clubmark um, and that there's also, uh, I think Camden Mark, we've had conversations about in the past, there are other um, organisations that, that have dedicated resources to do this kind of checking and make sure that, that certain organisations or certain subsets of activities within organisations have the requisite level of uh, documentation and certification um, that, that makes them trustworthy. Um, so that's, that's what and the MCR project is, is planning to do. Um, with or without standards, uh, but uh, they, they're keen to use them if, if they exist. Um, so it's quite timely from their point of view. Chris here from London Sport. Can I just check on Clubmark? Um, I understand that that's not supported by Sport England anymore. Um, I don't know if anyone else knows any more about the current um, status of Clubmark. Uh, no, I'm afraid not. That's old information. So that might well be um, a Camden mark is, is potentially old information as well. So I don't know what the current state of um, Clubmark is. That's probably something for Izzy. And uh, yeah, I can, I can she but did mention Clubmark when I chatted to her before. So. Um, 
So I guess this is a question maybe I should direct to Izzy, but does anyone know why Club Mark Sorry. and Club Mark have been deprecated? No, I don't. I've just looked on their website and it says, um, as of August 2019, Sport England is no longer providing general support for accreditation of Club Mark. Um, I, can, I can find out a little bit more from our workforce colleague on the sport. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll contact you about that. Um, that's that's curious. Um, but it sounds as though, generally speaking, um, we not we not just have a blank slate. We have a sort of erased slate for accreditation. Ah, so I'm just reading further on that article. Um, you, you pointed at Chris. Um, you can still go through the process if your NGB runs their own sport-specific accreditation. Um, so it might well be that it's actually NGBs now. And in fact, there's a list here of NGBs that do that, including golf, hockey, gymnastics, cycling, canoeing, um, which have their own accreditations. So it may just be that they've decentralized it. And indeed, Snowmark exists for snow sport still. Okay, and this maybe alludes to a, or points towards a question I think might come up later in connection with the specification, which is what exactly accreditation means. Um, that if it has this kind of more fine grained sports specific activity specific level, um, how we manage that is sort of an open question. And again, maybe that's a question more for Izzy. Um, Okay, so, well, I'll hand over to Nick at this point, actually, uh, unless anyone else has got any more insights to offer on accreditation as a whole. Uh, Nick, would you, would you care to take us through the, the uh, most crucial features of the proposal? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so I, I guess, um, following on from the conversation you just said, this proposal is really predicated on the idea that um, organizations are kind of providing accreditation. Uh, and that they're, they are um, uh, that they're, they're a reasonable source of of truth for that accreditation. Um, uh, talking to EMD earlier again, I don't think Shell's maybe Shell has not been able to make the call either. No, she's not. So EMD had mentioned that there were a number of different qualifications within EMD, and it's quite diverse different um, qualifications that exist. But it basically the the idea of this spec is. Let's assume that qualifications, that, that this kind of certification is decentralized. That's the first assumption. Second assumption is, let's assume that, um, that there is a level of, of a trustworthiness of these sources of accreditation themselves. So they do some kind of manual checking. These aren't just like documents that you upload with your session. Because if the documents can be uploaded with the session, then the, the approach here doesn't really make any sense because it's all just self-certified stuff. Um, however, if it's the case that there are bodies that, like MCR, uh, are, and we thought Clubmark were, but maybe maybe it's decentralized now, or some of the NGBs are, um, actually are um, credible sources. And I think BBC uh, Get Inspired used to do this when it existed. Uh, it used to vet the clubs that it, it accepted onto there. So assuming that some organizations are, are credible sources of this, um, then it makes sense to have a split between, and that's what this proposal um, is suggesting, a split between the people who publish the certification information and the people that publish the actual opportunities. And so let's use MCR Active, because I guess it's a real example and, and they're part of the proposal. Um, MCR Active are a accreditation organization, so they uh, have the people that do the checks and they've, they're gonna continue to, to do that. Um, I know actually in Berry, there's some, something similar with, um, uh, the project they have there, thinking about it, um, uh, which is I will if you will, and they had a, they had an accreditation person. So so let's assume that that person exists. That's a credit. That's a certification publisher, and on the other side you've got the opportunity data publisher like Open Sessions or Bookwen. So the idea is that um, if the sessions are published in Open Sessions and they're available for anyone to access, use, and share then someone can externally put a stamp of approval on one of those organizations uh, and a subset of their sessions or all of their sessions to say, I trust this organization. And they can do that stamp of approval in a way that can't easily be forged. So that let's say MCR Active approves an open sessions uh, organizer, that that is something that then is, it's not, e it's not easy for someone to pretend to be that organizer. Um, and so 
uh, that's something that is quite robust. And we, we can then trust as you're, when you're consuming both of those data sources and you can combine them together. So a, a feed of certifications on the one side and a feed of sessions on the other, and you can merge those two, which gives you that, that confidence that, you know, and, and you, you can then filter things that are accredited uh, and not. Does that make sense so far? The silence is not really Yeah. Uh, no, it, it makes sense to me. Um, it's still a few questions, but I'm sure we'll get to the bottom of that over the rest of this call, hopefully. Sure, sure. Okay, so certification publisher, opportunity publisher. That's the idea. Um, so just without looking at the code too deeply, because we don't need to get into the huge amount of technical detail, but to give you a sense of what the certification publisher would publish, they publish two things. The first thing they publish is what's called a scheme. Uh, the scheme is, uh, and, it, and it can just be made up by the certification publisher, depending on whatever certifications they have. Um, it's just basically a list of certifications. They could be levels, they could be uh, anything, really, uh, any kind of badge that, that is, is useful and credible. Those badges come with a URL that links through to what the requirements and criteria are for that badge and how um, trustworthy it is. Um, so those, those badges can then be put on websites like Get Active or Change for Life or wherever. Um, a there's a logo for the badge, so you can actually render it as a badge if you wanted to, or just put the name of it as a name as well. Um, so for example, level three for MCR Active, um, it's a bad example because you probably would, put, would call, want to call it MCR Active level three, so it would just stand alone. Um, so that's the idea that you have those certification levels defined in one place, and then you also have the publisher defined as well, so you can understand who it is that's uh, certifying. Um, so that's the first thing, you publish the levels. And the second thing is you publish the list. So if anyone's familiar with the RPDE kind of open, open standards that exist at the moment for, um, uh, for publishing opportunity data, it's exactly the same thing. Instead of a feed of uh, events though, you're just publishing a feed of certificate, uh, uh, certifications, uh, which is basically a link between an organizer and a certification level. So in this example, we're using book when, and basically saying that book when organizer 24601 is level four by change for life's level levels that they might have. Um, and so all we're really publishing is just a connection between those two things. Um, and the reason that that can't easily be forged is that the organizer URL uh, there is actually the ID that's in the, in the feed from book when or from open sessions. That's the ID of the organizer within those systems. And so as long as those systems, those organizer IDs can't be reused, which wouldn't be the case. Um, so if that would, that would be, sorry, that would be the case if you were um, using like an incrementing integer, for example, or you were just, you know, everyone gets an ID, you just be the next ID. So you would never get a, an existing ID reused by a different organization. So that's the identifier that gets certified. Um, and so they're the two things that gets published. And then the question is, well, if, you, if you're running one of these certification bodies and you're doing a self-service form, how do you make it really easy for someone to actually upload their session uh, documents, sorry, their, their certification documents? So the flow that MCR Active are thinking about is something like, you go in, you say, I'm a provider in Manchester. They say, what sessions do you run? Is it for ch children of vulnerable adults? Or is it just for adults? You select that and it says, right, you need to, and it says, which activities do you run it for? You select that and it says, which, these are the documents you need to upload. You upload those documents. And the next step is, um, where are your sessions published? And um, it will ask you for, uh, it will ask you to paste in the, the URL of the page, the, your organization's page on book when. So it's just like paste in the book, and it, maybe there's a little you know, diagram to explain how to do this. You just find the, the organization page on open sessions or uh, book when, and you copy and paste the page into the, uh, the flow of MCR Active. And then what it can do to know that you copied and pasted that correctly in that flow um, before moving on and completing that and letting a human tick off whether that's, that's valid or not, it's just a bit of the bit at the bottom here. So that, um, there's just a tiny little bit of a snippet of code that you put in to book when or you put into open sessions on the organizer pages. It just has this ID in it, which means that the, the um, whatever, whatever system is doing the trust stuff, um, so if that's MCR active, can easily just read that page and check that it's a valid page and that, that ID is valid uh, and um, it's the, that robust identifier. 
So it's just a, a small amount of validation, which will be enough to, um, to create that, that link. And then of course, anyone who's consuming the, consuming the data can take that ID from the open sessions feed or from the book when feed and link it to the ID that exists in uh, the list of trust certifications feed. And there you go. Um, that's, so that's, that's, I think there's one, one, actually one final thing I'll mention on this, um, which is that the other thing is that you can, if you're MCR active, you can choose other trust bodies to trust. So that's why it becomes a network. So MCR Active could choose to trust Clubmark, for example, or Clubmark could choose to trust MCR Active, um, which means that if you were an organization that maybe didn't want to go through and vet all of these individual schemes, you just wanted to pick one you trusted, like Clubmark, you might then be able to infer other, um, or, or, or EMD maybe, you might then be able to infer all the other types of accreditations that are relevant, and there might be a number of feeds there that you need to consume in order to bring all of those in. Um, but they'll all be from their own sources and they'll be maintained as the, everything else works independently. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, so that was, a, that was a great rattle through of, of the spec. Um, any questions from other people on the call? Apologies if I've missed something here, but does it definitely stop someone from submitting something and providing a reference to a valid certification, but just not for this particular activity? Yes. So it, it, um, you can when you sub, when you are a um, trust certificate provider, you've got the IDs in there for the. Uh, the pages on these sites so when the person is doing the tick thing to check you know when the, the manual stamp of approval is happening they can click through to that website and check that that's all as it should be as part of the document review so I guess they'd be reviewing the documents that are provided CRB checks whatever they're called now um, and then uh, and then and alongside that the uh, yeah the website that says these are the sessions that looks credible great they're the same thing um, and then because the website itself is the thing that's, I guess, being approved, um, then yeah, that's, that's, and, and then, oh yeah, and then you can supply as well, I, I should have mentioned that, you can supply um, as the accreditation body a, a list of activities and an age range w for which the certification is valid. And so um, just to, yeah, the last example in that list there. So here you can, you can say this is only valid for body pump and it's only valid for activities that are relevant for over 18s. And that okay, would be perfect. Your, yeah. Okay. So if, if I if I get accreditation on something, I can't then purport to submit that as accreditation for other things. Yes. Absolutely. That's yeah, that's the question you're asking. Yeah, that makes sense. Excellent. Thanks. I guess just a thought on how um how likely it is that the accreditation bodies will be ready, willing, and able to um, set up these kind of feeds uh, and publish, or set up the feeds to kind of then link in with open sessions and book when, if we've got not a centralized body, if we've got perhaps 15 different uh, NGBs, um, whether this is a relatively easy thing for them to do or something that might take a bit more work. Yeah, it's a good question. I guess this is quite a light touch. I mean, it might be that we can provide a, a tiny bit of open source code that does the like little validation of the ID bit that they'll all need to do, obviously, when they paste that ID in um, to help with adoption. But apart from that, it's just a case of kind of, I guess, uh, uh, if they've already got a big database of all the people they trust, this is just basically a, a feed of that database, uh, as uh, other kind of RPD feeds are. So I guess the maybe the work involved is quite minimal. Um, maybe with the, the small addition of this kind of tick box, this um, ID thing you paste in, which we might be able to help with the library. Um, we know MCR Active are very keen to do this. Um, and I guess that's why, that's what's kind of driven this to a, a point of maybe we should do this spec now. Because we've, we've been talking about this kind of thing on and off for the years, but not actually had a driver to do it. Um, but obviously with MCR Active's um, project is about to kick off and that this is a kind of core, core thing for them, a requirement for them. So 
they would certainly be keen to provide the data. I think you're right, we probably need to do a bit of a, uh, when we chat to Sports England about these other schemes, we need to have a quick uh, uh, chat to a few different organizations who are publishers, maybe bring some of them on this call or, or if they can't make it separately and just check that they're happy and that they're, you know, they've got longevity to their schemes. They're not like winding them down or anything. And that's something that you want to do. I wonder if it's also just worth comparing the list of schemes and accreditation there is with the types of opportunity data that, that we're seeing. Get um, just looking at NGD list, maybe some activity types that wouldn't fall under those. Um, and maybe some areas actually there isn't a, a sufficient accreditation scheme in, in place at the moment. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Yeah, this, uh, looking at the list of um, what we've got on here, there's probably, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's probably probably badminton, uh, netball, um, and swimming are the obvious ones um, because they're, uh, they're already data that's decentralized. Triathlon orienteering and cycling actually have their own data sources for most of the sessions uh, just in, in the UK. Um, although that's not exclusive, obviously, that can you can put cycling sessions on open sessions. Um, so it might be, it might be interesting to talk to those guys as well about how if they'd be interested to open up two feeds rather than just combining it into one, and then therefore allowing other people to you know for example put cycling sessions on open sessions. Um, it feels like a small standalone server to produce this feed would be useful as a reference for someone building it to other systems and also for smaller organizations. Even if it's something whereby you put a URL in, it then opens that in a new tab and you check it. And then there's some check boxes for you to say, yes, it's this, that, and the other. And then that just puts it into a local database that then can provide the feed. Because small organizations, they could literally just get that set up and that's their feed. Yeah, uh, so just so sorry, just to check when you mean that's their feed, do you mean, uh, sorry, how does that work? feed. So this is, you need something that can provide um, the, the accrediting organization needs to provide a feed of things they've accredited. Yeah. As a small organization, if I have some kind of thing I can log into, I can paste in a URL to it, and then say, yes, I approve this, that, and the other, and then it generates the accredited feed from that set of URLs, and I can go in and delete something. I can manage my accreditation feed, and all I needed was the technical expertise to get someone to set this up for me, or possibly some organization provides this for others as, as software as a service or whatever it is, but it feels like mm -hmm. in order to play, right now you need a, a dev team to build something. Yeah. Right, so is there, is there, is there like a, a lightweight tool that would be able to, you can copy and paste a spreadsheet into that will generate the feed and then maintain it in there type thing? Yeah, or just put in URL one by one for, yeah, bulk loading would be nice as well, but the real value on an ongoing basis seems to be able to, to check the box to say, yes, this is over 18 only, this is of this type and that, otherwise everything is going to be a generic feed of, yes, we approve everything from this site which might be fine in some cases, but it only needs something for some provider to take their, their one accreditation and parlay that into a bunch of other stuff and something to go wrong on one of the other stuff and yeah. have problems. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's good. I mean, we maybe maybe worth talking to MCR to see if they want to open source some of the uh, logic around that, although that might be unlikely given their um, constraints, and, but, but we can definitely have the conversation. Um, but and yeah, and, and, and an additional tool, it's a great idea. And sorry, one thing that I actually missed yesterday, what are the three levels or four levels um, in, the, in the MCR schema that's trusted, untrusted, not relevant? No, no, they're not, they're, they're, they're actually, they're weird. They're, I don't think they're levels either. Um, they're not actually one, I don't think three is necessarily greater than two. Mm -hmm. um, I think three, I think that the, the levels are actually relevant to different types of providers. Right. Okay. Or maybe they are greater, it's not strictly greater than. So I think it's like level one is adults. Level two is uh, adults, children and vulnerable adults. And level three is those things plus some bells on, I think. 
Right, okay, so sort of different categories. So we're looking at, yeah, so certification authorities might have a binary judgment. They might have a five-level scheme. It could be it could be arbitrarily complex. Right, yeah, exactly. I mean, basically, they might have one badge, they might have five, yeah. or they might give out multiple badges. Um, and if, as long as, um, because I suppose the other thing is that we don't know what the um, data users are going to want to filter on, which, which schemes they trust. So I guess as long as these are all published, then people can make informed decisions about which schemes uh, they'll accept. Which also seems to be, from what I from this, the, 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 some of the chats I've had on this, it seems that uh, that actually is a fairly complex question for a lot of these organizations. It's not just a case of, oh yeah, that's a nice URL, I'll just use that list. They need to understand how the, what the processes are behind it and if the process is efficient. And if there's a problem, if they can actually contact the organization to get hold of the original certificates um, that were used in the, yeah, so that, that kind of thing. So some, it depends on the, if you go to the nth on it, I think you, they probably need probably quite high trust relationships between the trust organizations, if you see what I mean, right. uh, between, between the users and the trust organizations. Um, but if you're just at the kind of casual level of um, a bit like change for life, uh, it's like, can we make this slightly better than just putting a warning on the website? Um, then, yeah, this is probably where you can take the warning off and put a badge on instead. Okay, uh, no, I was, just, I was just vaguely thinking about application logic and how, I suppose, how defensible it has to be. Um, mm -hmm. Within the scope of the standard, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a free form thing for the certifying organizations to define for themselves. Um, Any further questions on the uh, specification itself? Is there any um, thought on sort of crossover with the accessibility discussions that are going on? Because if I think about the social prescribers who may want to refer to a session, they've talked about also wanting to know, like, is someone qualified, but is this session going to be suitable for a beginner? Or something like that? Are these two discussions kind of best kept being separate, or is there some crossover? Uh, and the, well, there's so there's a um, well, it's a couple of things. So so I guess part of what this is assessing is that the data is valid and generally reasonable in quality. Um, so you know if people start writing rubbish in their descriptions, or um, even actually in MCR's case, um, they're going to do things like check that the where they can, where they have relationships in place with booking systems, check that the sessions aren't canceled too often, things like that. And if a, if a provider cancels their own sessions three times in a row, then they lose their badge. So they're gonna be quite, um, I, I think they're gonna do that by checking the feeds. I'm not entirely sure what they're gonna, how they're gonna do it, but yeah, that. So, so, so some, I guess, uh, take the, let this to also be a bit of a quality assurance exercise as well as just, um, uh, does, does it have the relevant documents? Um, but, uh, so, so to that end, does it have the beginner levels in there? Do, the accessibility information is that accurate? Probably falls under that a little bit. Um, I guess if there's an accessibility accreditation body, that could be an interesting thing. So, um, what what um, EFDS? All these organisations are rebranded, and I've forgotten all the new names. Sorry, uh, whatever EFDS became, uh, Accessibility Alliance. Um, they uh, may want to do the same thing and accredit things uh, themselves. I guess we should probably have that conversation um, separate to categorizing things. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's a, it's a good point. I suppose we should probably have at least one conversation with those guys around this, uh, identify if that's something they'd be interested in doing. Um, but I suppose if this is suitably generic, then it doesn't need specific uh, kind of connections. Maybe. Yeah, it makes sense. So you said that you potentially could have someone who is verifying accessibility and certifying that across a number of activity types or sessions. I don't know if that makes sense, but you could use this framework to do that. Yeah, totally. And in fact, you could probably extend quite easily the, the, the activity and age filters we've got on there to accessibility support as well. Um, so that you could say, you know, if something is um, suitable for visually impaired people, and here's the certification that says they know how to deal with blind dogs, as uh, so with guide dogs. Um, then, uh, if someone tries to put a, uh, you know, something that's suitable for, for hard of hearing, deaf uh, people, uh, hearing impairment, 
um, then obviously they don't, that certification doesn't apply to those activities. So it's the similar, I, I guess you could take a similar approach uh, to that. Yeah, and I suppose equally it could apply to a scenario like competence of instruction up to a certain level so that the martial arts, for instance, you know, uh, can instruct yellow belt, can instruct green belt, black belt, etc. Again, it's just a question of an authority having certain defined terms. Um, and that would, th I guess the only, the only thing that would have to change is that probably we need to think about what we call this bit of the fact that it's not really about safeguarding, although that will be one common, I guess it's just more generally about certification of competence, I suppose. Yes. Okay. Um. <laughs> uh, sorry, can I just ask a, from a, an activity uploader's point of view, so someone goes on open sessions and they upload their table tennis sessions that are going on, um, if they've already got an accreditation separately, is there anything at that point they would need to do? Or if it was up and running, working perfectly, then uh, run me how that would kind of be linked between the session provider and the session I'm sorry, Chris. Could you just say that again? I think you drop out for a bit there. You're going in and out, Chris, in your um, voice for some reason. Sorry. Um, can you hear me all right now? Yeah, much better. Yep. Better. Okay. Um, if for a person who is on open sessions and they are uploading a table tennis session, and say they've already got accreditation with Table Tennis England. Um, and if the, both systems are working perfectly, who would, who actually makes that link between the own concessions organization and the current accreditation? Is that the small provider or is that Table Tennis England? Uh, so, um, uh, I think, I think probably the, the link that needs to happen there is that there's a, um yeah it, it, because it, because it probably is on them to go to table tennis england and then you know apply for accreditation to be recognized there after they go to open sessions um because that's the the url link is that way around you have to on table tennis england they have to see the open session stuff and then approve it um so if they've got to that's the kind of stamp um i guess what this isn't currently set up for is just a, a certificate which is self self assessed or self accredited. So, um, if you've got well, well, or even that's been given to you and you've just got in a cupboard somewhere. So, if you've got Table Tennis England saying, "Yeah, your this is your certificate," um, you're just uploading that as a document and just providing it. Or even if Table Tennis England on their website have just got a big list. I suppose um, you would still need to go to Table Tennis England and have them associate your open sessions page with the organisation they recognise you as. In Table Tennis England, so it sounds like that you'd have to go to table tennis, table tennis England. So I guess it's just a question there about how how we realistically signpost people to know what accreditation they need. Because basically, if you, yeah, see what you're saying. If you put your stuff on open sessions, that's not the end of your journey. You might need to, depending on the activity you've selected, uh, that you know you might have a relevant certification or the area you're providing it in if it's in manchester or something you might have a relevant certification body you should seek out to try and uh get yourself ticked off yeah i mean i want like you could in the future get it to a point where open sessions recognizes the activity type that you've put in and then you get to the end of the flow of uploading it and it says would you like to submit this to table tennis england and then it goes through to the way if they have a scheme up and running um that would be lovely. Yeah. You know, a customer journey from uploading it to submitting it to the certification provider. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, actually, that's probably a, yeah, that probably is something that I don't know what the end point looks like that you're, you're hitting when that last step happens, but there's probably something additional needed um, so that you can seamlessly move from open sessions. I, I guess the assumption with the spec as written is that the open session or book when wouldn't do anything special apart from just that little bit of a, um, HTML code. But I guess if you wanted to, yeah, massively optimize the journey there, then yeah, that would be good. You, you, 
to do that. And I suppose we'd also want to, um, maybe the thing to do actually is uh, the accreditation scheme could uh, have a associated um, set of activities to allow you to do the filtering you just mentioned there, Chris. Yeah. So then if you've consumed a bunch of schemes yourself, you could then recommend which scheme. And obviously the scheme, it should have like a submission URL that someone can just go to, uh, to, to, to send them to, to, to kind of, so I guess adding those two things in would probably allow for that. Yeah, I guess it just feels like already at the moment, it's quite a difficult process to get people to go to open sessions, upload sessions, keep them up to date. So adding in the additional bit of kind of verifying it or certifying it, we've got to make it as easy as possible. Um, yeah make it actually happen definitely definitely okay so will one of you add this as a uh, comment on the issue uh, i can take that uh, i can take that that if you want uh, submission url and uh uh yeah um and oh and activities that it's appropriate for yeah okay right Okay, any further comments on the on the um, certification stack, reporting stack as is? Okay, uh, sounds, it seems like a nicely, nicely thought out, flexible specification, Nick. Well, I would say, it's, yeah, if, if everyone, when we talk to the other bodies, it works. Um, certainly, the, uh, this has been a product of lots of conversations over a long period of time. So I feel like this is the, uh, just, just a very, very easy summary of uh, lots of iterative thinking. But, um, but yeah, it might still have a way to go. But yeah, we sounds like we should uh, have a, a further few conversations with Izzy, with Clubmark people, or with, with some of the other NGPs. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be in touch with Izzy shortly. Great. Um, and uh, I feel like there's only another couple of points on the agenda. We've got 10 minutes. Um, I think the other two points might not necessarily generate a lot of discussion. Um, you know, about um, the minor amendments to the booking spec that um, Nick will be again well aware of both of these. Um, so the, the first is, um, lining up checkout with memberships, uh, which doesn't require any very large amendment to the specification. Uh, Nick, can you speak to that at all? Uh, yeah, so this is about allowing a, someone who's got a membership already at GLL or another site, for example, to, um, to another provider to use that um, membership when they make a booking through open booking um, to do that they'll need to first use use some some sort of OAuth flow to um, verify they are indeed a member that the member they say they are using and passwords for the membership and when that's happened you get that member ID and then the idea here is that you can still you can then use that member ID to make a booking uh, on behalf of that person and that means that they can then uh, they're subject to the whatever discounts that um, they they would qualify for in in the system as normal. That's it. Um, is anybody here actually running a booking system? Um, yeah, I'm wondering if we've actually got the right audience for. <laughs> We haven't got Legend or Gladstone on the call in tennis. So I think we asked them for this one. So um, maybe that's not, I mean, Chris is a booking system, but it's a different type of booking system, I guess. No, I don't think it's quite, um, many, we haven't seen many use cases like that from open sessions. Okay, great. Um, and then I guess relatedly, there's been a little bit of discussion about, about how you do the information from a unique identifier. It could typically be an email address for children. Um, which has been a sort of involved conversation. 
Yeah, and, and so, that, so on this one, this is and potentially slightly more generic actually. If you've got, um, because there's a, there's a situation with open booking where you might be logged in on Change for Life and have a user ID, but to Legend or, or Open Sessions, you're a guest. Um, and you're not, you're not, you don't have a login to Legend as such. So you're, you're a guest as far as Legend's concerned, but you're a known user as far as Change for Life is concerned. And so if that happens, then the idea is that we should probably include an ID from Change for Life, if there is one. Let's say that you've already got a member ID in Change for Life that's like 254 or something. You might as well pass that through if as Change for Life you're comfortable to do so as an optional field so that if you're doing analytics on the booking system, you can see repeated trends of users doing things because that's the same user twice. They might be the same guest user twice, um, but you can, you can that way you can reference that that's the same guest user that's, um, that's uh, yeah, and then if there's any interesting behaviors, you can learn from, from that user um, uh, and, and what, they're, what they're purchasing and, and how they're, and which, which um, front ends they're coming through, things like that. So that was the idea. And, and also, of course, for children, it means that if you don't have an email address, that ID can be used in place of a unique identifier as an email, um, which is the current, you know, current mandatory um, requirement for making a booking. But for the attendees themselves, um, if you put in a child's first name and surname, um, you could use this identifier as well to identify that child. Um, yeah. Yeah, but again, this seems more like the domain typically of a commercial provider, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Although, I mean, it might be interesting. I don't know if, well, I don't, I don't know where you are with, um, with open booking, Chris, but it, it sounds that's the kind of thing that's more for the booking system side again. Uh, yeah, sorry, from my point, I'm not quite up to speed with that at the moment, so I couldn't probably contribute at this point. Yeah, yeah. Same as last one then, probably. Okay, well, that's probably just as well, given that we've got, um, let me see here, we have six minutes left on the call, um, so I will just hand it over to the floor. Um, any other business anyone would like to bring to the group? That sounds like a no. Everyone's okay. Uh, Chris, as you're as you're there, could you just post your GitHub username to the chat? Um, I'll have to find out what my GitHub username is, but um, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, don't worry. Don't worry I'll, if you don't. I'll just I'll just reference you by name. Uh, okay. I was going to at you. Sorry, Tim. I will look into that. Okay, well, on that note, then, um, I will say thank you to everyone who was on the call today. Um, I think that's some useful feedback there. And uh, there's a couple of actions arising from that. I will distribute the notes, video recording, and slides on Friday. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Tim. Okay, thanks, thanks, guys. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Thanks.